Hi, I'm Marty Fortin with the Association of Washington School Principals. And I'm Greg Barker with the Association of Washington Student Leaders. We're here today to talk about booster clubs and how they interact with the programs that you have at school and how they can give you that needed and helpful and necessary um, money that you can always find uses for. We're here to say that, that many enthusiastic and caring parents are willing to help, but they don't really know the implications of all of their involvement. Honestly, I've had parents call me and say, I was elected president of the Booster Club last night because I wasn't at the meeting. What do I do now, Marty? So we designed this presentation to talk about what are the, what are the legal things that Booster Clubs have to do to stay, to keep the parents protected, and yet it helps you have positive interactions with your boosters as they work for your program. And because of so many changes as a, uh, in your school, we want to also make sure that there's sustainability for these groups because there's quite an influx of, of new officers each year or each uh, rotation that comes through. The worst possible thing that can happen is that your some of the parents that jo join enthusiastically could join the booster club and then somehow quit early on thinking that that's no fun and all of a sudden there's a sour taste in their mouth about that. So we'll try to give you the structure of what those clubs need to operate and help protect those parents. Now for the presentation, boosters will mean all of those groups designed to support school activities. PTA, Washington State P Parent Teacher Association, PTO which is a more generic type of approach, scholarship committees, senior trip committees, robotics clubs, alumni associations, uh, parent groups who, who gather together to raise money for equestrian teams, and of course those uh, more traditional sports boosters. So let's start into the 15, top 15 rules about booster clubs. And the first one is, no one owns the booster club. Booster clubs owned by the, uh, by the membership and directed by the board of directors. It doesn't belong to the basketball coach, it doesn't belong to any individual, it's really a collective that's there. In order to be registered with the Secretary of State, you file with them, ask for a certificate of incorporation, you give them your bylaws, you give them your articles of incorporation, um, and you pay a small fee. After a vetting process in which they'll ask for certain things, and we'll talk about delusion, uh, dissolution clauses later on, but you're issued a certificate much like the one here. This is for the Stanford Booster, Stanwood Booster Club. They've been around for 30 years. But there's a number you can see on the left, a 601 number. That's really your state business ID number. It's called a UBI, and it's things that you're often asked for when you make transactions. And one of the keys about registering with the Secretary of State is that that is a, a database that's searchable, so you can always go back and look and see which ones are active, which ones have been registered with the Secretary of State. As a side, when the aud uh, auditor comes in, they'll often do a search on the Secretary of State's website to see all those organizations that use your school name or your school mascot's name, and then may ask you questions about what are your interactions with those clubs wanting to make sure that you're not using a public resource to support those private businesses. Now they are a private business. They're independent. It's private funds. Uh, the, um, the ASB funds are, are public funds and we have a whole uh, show that we did on public funds, but your booster club funds are private money, private funds, really not collect, connected to the school. If you've been had interactions with Washington State PTA, Washington State PTA actually uh, prompts you to say you're a student advocacy organization, you're not a so school supporting organization, you're your own independent business. We really try to delineate in the graphic that is included in the handouts really show the difference between a booster club and the ASB so you can see that private side versus public side and keep it on the right side of the line. I often say booster club is just another business in your community and how will you deal with all those other businesses that are in your community. So booster clubs can use school facilities to advance their pr purpose. Uh, a facility use form is the most typical way to do that. Sometimes that form could list all of your meetings for the year on line one that says we're going to meet the first Monday of the month for all the school year. It's approved by someone in your district, often the principal, maybe sometimes in a small district the superintendent, and that gives you the right to use the facilities, often without, without cost. Booster clubs and school supporting organizations, usually in your, in your um, school board policy, says they can use the facility for free unless there's some charges incurred for cleanup by a, a custodian. Uh, you may also have other tiers in your board policy that allow other nonprofits to use the facility for a small cost. 
Uh, it's typically a, an up-and-coming church that needs a place for worship, may want to use your school auditorium, and you can charge them for that. That goes back into the district funds. And then sometimes a for-profit organization might want to come use your, your facilities to raise money, and, and often the district policy says you charge more. And this is where you can get some real traction with your booster clubs as you're working with them because they want to be officially recognized so that they can fall into that tier of your district policy to allow use and, and hopefully or possibly even free use of, of facilities and paying for direct costs. The other thing that booster clubs can do is use a lot, utilize unused um, facilities at the school for their purposes. You may have a concession stand and ASB doesn't want to run it or you can't find people to run it. And, and you may reach an agreement with the, with that booster club that they can have access to that facility and maybe exclusive access to the facility given uh, the agreement that you have. Now when you have an agreement like that, then it's signed by whoever the board authorizes to sign contracts, maybe the superintendent, maybe the business manager, probably not the athletic director or the activities coordinator, but it gives them the boosters the right to use facilities and talks about what kind of revenue sharing they may do. Next. The IRS expects proper accounting. You can get a TIN, which is a taxpayer identification number, sometimes called an EIN, employer identification number. You get those online. Uh, you get nonprofit status with the state of Washington online. The IRS also has tax exempt status, which is often called the 501C3. There are lots of C's. C3 is, three is the one that most clubs have. But under federal income tax law, any income is taxable. So as you raise money, um, you may have to report some of that to the IRS too. But the key to that is that this is a, a body that exists in and of itself and you do want to make sure that it's clear that this is income for the booster club as opposed to individuals who would then have the individual tax liability. Creating a booster club without going through some of these um, qualifications with the IRS and with the Secretary of State may incur private liabilities to the individuals who are on your booster club. In fact, if we look at the next slide, um, we look at those duties of a nonprofit director, that's the uh, elected officers, that there's a duty of obedience and care and knowledge and knowing what your rules are, uh, following those rules and taking care that no one gets a personal advantage out of that are called fiduciary duties. If you're incorporated, the board has that liability for fiduciary duties. In the event of a breach, the board can be held liable. What we've discovered upon advice from an attorney is that if you're not incorporated, if you're acting without uh, the auspices of the state of Washington, the Secretary of State, then all members that attend meeting within a 12-month period may have some liability in the case of some negligence. Next. So it's really important that we're not using public funds and resources for our booster club, that they're able to, and because they're a business, we have to treat them that way. So they can ha pay for direct costs like copies or supplies and things like that, but that we're not giving those away and that they don't be able to use those without that um, reimbursement to the school or the ASB. And this is not a rule that's easily changed, can't be changed by your school board and so on because it's part of the Washington State Constitution, Article 8, Section 7. It's often called the gift of public funds, and that's a, a, a thing that you have to weigh. Are you giving away public funds? Now, some of your districts may have some de minimis rules around the use of your facility. Uh, I know of districts that say they can have 30 copies a month in the coffee machine with any of your nonprofits that are supporting you, any of the PTAs and boosters, um, because the cost of billing for $3 worth of copies uh, is within de minimis. So there is a de minimal use, but essentially um, you can't use those resources you have. In so much as if the school district gets a bid for some kind of equipment or materials, the booster club cannot play off that bid and also get that same advantage. Next, as a booster club, you cannot be supporting political candidates. Um, that no part of what you, that you carry on um, promote someone who's running for office. That would be someone running for school board, someone running for county commissioner, or state legislature, or even the federal government. Now you can be involved in an insubstantial way in helping with initiatives or causes. So the uh, district comes to the, the boosters and say, will you help donate for our levy? And it is possible to do that. You might want to check with the Public Disclosure Commission when you do that to make sure you're following their rules too. 
but political candidates are no-no. I once had a phone call from a district, not a district, from a booster club who had did the football program and in it they had ads and a county commissioner running for office, rerunning for office, wanted to put their picture in an ad, please vote for, for this commissioner. I said, would the public understand that you're su not supporting that person or simply selling an ad? And I got a call later and said that they had had a long talk and decided they weren't going to be involved in even that kind of support. I think the key to that is people have their own political, they can be involved with political candidates, but they need to make it very clear as they're acting as the individual and separate themselves from any booster club activity uh, if they're an officer or a member of a booster club. All right, the next rule, and this is what makes you a nonprofit, is you don't sell stock and you don't have profit sharing. So when we hear we're not for profit, yeah, that means we don't have a profit sharing, we don't pay our officers, our trustees, our board of directors, we don't offer common stock that people can invest in our business, um, that that's the nonprofit side, that's what makes it a nonprofit. But you should make a profit. Um, you should have money to carry over, you sh could have long-term plans to, to improve the concession stand or buy a trailer that serves concessions or saving money for playground equipment for the elementary school. That's what your profits are for, so you should always make a profit, and you should always have carryover at the end of each year. And that could be very clearly uh, decided within your bylaws. I had one club, the, the Cheer Booster Club, actually always spent all of their money, and they started the next year with $500. But their bylaws indicated that that's what they needed to do. Um, if you have uh, carryover money, you want to make sure that there's purpose and that the, the board has decided why are we carrying money forward in the, uh, some of the examples that Marty shared. Next, you have to have a disillusion clause. So when you file for state recognition, in your Articles of Incorporation, you must, you must state what happens if your booster club fails, falls away, if you decide no longer to be in business. Uh, the local booster club that I'm involved in in our community if we dissolve, the money goes to the ASB. The Principals Association, if it ever dissolves, the money goes to a healthcare organization. The, no longer will the Secretary of State even allow you to become incorporated unless you have that dissolution clause. And the Gambling Commission asks to see that clause whenever you apply for a gambling license. So it's really key because this dissolution clause and a lot of this information that we're talking about would have been created when you first started. So that sustainability, that's what we're talking about in keeping these documents so that they can be passed on to the next group, that they exist uh, to be able to be shared. And so that's one of the key things to look at is where are our records and where are they kept and how do we pass them on? Next, a school employee can have a private life. Anyone that works for the school could go work for another business in town. As I've said over and over again, um, booster clubs are just another business in town. So you can imagine a teacher in the summer working at a local Safeway. That's allowable. In that same way, a school employee can have a private life, can work for the booster club, can help. But the key is, what would the prudent person and how would they view that activity? Does it look like it's a school activity because it's a teacher who's well known, who's wearing school attire? Or does it look like a booster club activity that's engaged the teachers in helping them uh, meet their, their goals? If you have a school employee who's a part of a booster club, please warn them not to use the copy machine, not to use their computer, not to use the school phones, or not to use any time of the day in which they're paid for to be a teacher, because when they do that, they're using public money to support that private organization. Yet if after school they go home and they use their home computer and they use their home copy um, printer to do things for the boosters, that's absolutely fine. It just really takes a little bit of forethought and sitting down and planning it out. Next, all organizations in the state of Washington have tax liabilities, not only for employees, but for their purchases, even out of state. If you buy something and put it in service, you must pay an excise tax, a sales tax on it. If you hire an employee to do work for you, you must keep their taxes out and pay, uh, send the money in to the state of Washington and, the, and to the federal government. One of the things that's, that's happened um, over time are that booster clubs have been formed to help students raise money to go to camp or perhaps to buy their cheer uniforms. And so the student then works in a fundraiser for the booster club 
and as a result, they get their way paid to camp or they get their cheer uniform paid for. But an analysis of that, that means they've been employees of that private business, that they provided services and labor for the business, and they got a contribution, even though it's non-cash, they got uh, something purchased for them, and now they become employees. So as you think about your booster clubs and how they hire students or how they have students engage in fundraising for their personal gain, uh, now they're employ employees of that organization. In that same vein, if you purchase something at a grocery store, if you purchase something at a local hardware store, you must pay tax for it. Your tax ID number is not to get a relief from paying taxes. Now you can purchase things for resale and not pay the tax when you buy them, but pay the tax afterwards if you get a reseller's permit. Those are available online for, from the state of Washington. You fill that out and you get a number that you can use when you purchase something, but it does mean then you need to submit sales tax after the sale is over. Now there is one caveat with that, that for uh, temporary fundraisers, and this is a, a law that went into effect in the late 90s that we all celebrated at summer camps because we could sell t-shirts and not have a sales tax liability. Well it also applies to your booster clubs for fundraisers that are not a regular part of business, not an enterprise service, but simply a fundraiser that if they have a reseller's permit and they follow the rules that are outlined on the website um, that they can, uh, that's Department of Revenue website, that they can purchase items and sell them without a tax liability. Now the interesting part that applies to all businesses is that if you purchase something and put it in service and you have to pay a tax, it doesn't matter where you buy it if you were charged the tax. So if you bought something out of Oregon and paid zero tax, you still as a booster club need to figure out what that tax is and send the Department of Revenue. If you bought something in Idaho and paid less tax than in Washington, you need to figure out the difference and send it in. In so much as if you bought something at a yard sale for the perfect costume for the drama club and you didn't pay tax, sales tax for that, now you need to compute that sales tax and send it in. This applies to all businesses and Chula Peak Learning Center, which is close to, to Idaho, often we go across the state line to a hardware store locally and make purchases. The cost for the tax is less than the state of Washington and we too have to figure out the difference and send it in. So again, the key is forethought, and if you think about this and you can run a shorter fundraiser, then that's a little more revenue where you don't have to pay sales tax if you can keep it within that window that's allowable by the Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue website has lots of guidelines about having sales and when taxes are due, so we'd encourage you to go to that dor.wa.gov website and find out more. One of the things that is really necessary is to have insurance. This would be li liability insurance in case of, of negligence that you may have, in case you may have some spilled water at the concession stand who somebody trips on and falls down and hits your head, or that you have a, a sale of food and something's improperly cooked and someone gets ill and you, you're slapped with a lawsuit. Insurance will help you then through that neg negligence. It hires the attorney. It hires the investigator. Uh, the recommendations these days are at least a minimum of a million dollars per occurrence, better two million dollars per occurrence, uh, that your insurance covers that. You can find that insurance at a number of places in the state of Washington, but it, it certainly protects you when the event that you're sued. And remember, anybody can sue anybody in, the, in our state. Uh, it's up to the courts to figure out the difference. And while that happens, you need representation, and those boosters need to have someone who who guides them through that process um, and is covered through this liability insurance. And almost this is hands down a requirement for you to use facilities at districts. While they'll recognize you as a booster club, they will always ask, um, we need a certificate of liability insurance, please. And you'll need to update that every year. Next, if you're going to gamble, you need to have a 501c3 status to hold raffles. And raffles are about the only kind of gambling that you can do. And a raffle has three elements. It has a cost, a chance, and a prize. You charge for a ticket, a ticket's pulled by lot, and you win a prize. Um, in order to do that, you need to have a gambling license in order to do, more, excuse me, more than two a year. You need to have a license. If you're a 501c3, you can do two in a calendar year, up to $5,000 gross without the license. But any more than that, you need to have a gambling license. Now there is another thing called a game of skill. 
in which that, or amusement game is the other term for it, in which you take away the element of chance. So if you, if you pay a dollar and try to kick a field goal or, or shoot a half course shot, that's a game of skill. And you can do two of those within a calendar year with a $5,000 gross. Now the interesting part is uh, minors are not allowed to gamble. So if you're 18 years of age, you can and be involved in gambling, but under 18 you can't. But amusement games, you can be under the age of 18 and be involved. Again, if you go to the Washington State Gambling Commission's website, it, there's a tutorial there and there's more information on that. And also remember, if you're a subordinate club, a part of a larger club, that it's the larger club that can only have two in a calendar year that are unlicensed. So you do need to have that consideration of how are we part of the bigger picture? Are we our own 501c3 or are we part of a larger group? And that's good conversation and good communication between all the groups at your school. So if you have an umbrella organization that has football boosters and volleyball boosters and basketball boosters and softball boosters, your umbrella organization gets two a year without a gambling license, not two for football and two for volleyball and so mm -hmm. on. In that same vein, that's true in the public schools too. You can have two gambling events in a calendar year if your board, school board approves that, but it's not two for the French club and two for the wrestling team and on and on. It's just two for the ASB. So who else is interested in boosters? As we look at this, this list, the Secretary of State wants to know if your booster clubs are registered with them. The Gambling Commission wants to know if you're doing raffles um, or other gambling events, which um, you may have to have additional registration, additional fees to do any kind of other events. Department of Ecology wants to know if you're doing car washes or you're having, having sporting events which are selling concessions. Labor and Industry wants to know if you have employees or even if you have volunteers who could be injured as a result of participating or volunteering for your organization. Um, the Washington State PTA wants to know if you call yourself a PTA that you have joined them. And the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction is really concerned about equity and Title IX and donations from those outside organizations of boosters that support individual sporting teams is the school using that money in an equitable manner? Finally, the Washington State Auditor would like to know if the, what the interaction is between that private business and your public employees whenever the school time is, um, programs are held. And that key with the auditor is what name are you using because you, can, you can't use the school name because then it falls into the public money and it falls into the ASB. So you want to very clearly delineate yourself as a booster club, a parent support group. However you define yourself, but that all of your literature, all of your signage, all of your advertising is very clear that this is a booster club activity versus um, that it's the students that are involved in it with ASB. A note is that the, boost, the, the auditor, when they come, they come to your building, they will do what's called a bank sweep, where they subpoena the names of all organizations in your community that use the school name or the mascot name. If you find um, a booster club that is listed, then they'll want to know what the interaction is. If the signers on that booster club are as your school employees, now you may have had employees who've crossed the line and used that public resource to support that private business. So those are the 15 rules. There are FAST 15 rules. They're designed to help your boosters and parent groups, uh, all parent groups, be successful and be compliant with the rules. Thank you for your time and we hope you find this useful and be able to share it with your booster clubs and hopefully meet with your booster clubs on an annual basis uh, so that you can continue that, that longevity and sustainability as you get new parents in and, and lots of changes. We will also um, make available some supporting materials uh, about boosters when you look at this, this video that you can also download to pass on to those that are working to support your programs in your school. Thank you. Thank you.